Hello and welcome to this edition of In Focus, brought to you by the Ngozi Institute. I am your host, Wamaka Kifukwe. On this program, we'll be discussing Africa's perspective on climate change as it relates to the management of natural resources. We'll be joined by Professor Yoba Sokona, the Special Advisor for Sustainable Development at the South Center based in Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Sokona, welcome to the program. Thank you. So just for the benefit of our audience who weren't at the African Leadership Forum, could you sum up what you presented this morning just in a few very key messages and then we can go a little bit further and dive into it as the interview progresses. I start by articulating that energy is one of the critical element of climate and better management of natural resources. And having said that, dealing with climate or management of natural resources, that has been the context of national development perspective, development aspirations. And we need really to deconstruct the energy narrative in the continent uh, by uh, setting the agenda, because we are not setting the energy agenda. And at the same time, that gives to us an opportunity and then to bring together national development aspiration, fighting against climate change, and achieving sustainable development goals. And then all can be done hand in hand, provided that, and then we set the agenda and we follow the agenda. And Africa has the advantage, the advantage that African have, none of the other continent has because our energy system is not yet in place. Because the basic infrastructure that frame the future development is not yet in place. Our agrarian system needs to be developed. And the new stock of house is much more important than the existing stock. So we can leapfrog in many uh, possibilities. And then the only way for us to leapfrog is to deal with the energy issues first. And then we've also taking development as first. We enter climate change on development issue rather than try to look at the climate and then later on the development aspect. It's the disconnect between the two because we cannot make that disconnect because climate is already there. All the scientific evidence indicated it. And then second, we have seen the impact of climate change everywhere in the world, and then this is escalating. And then we cannot ignore them. And then how can we conceive our development without looking at the climate? For instance, if you want to build a dam today in drought prone area in Africa, it will be affected by climate, and then the cost of the dam, we, whether we like it or not, climate is incorporated, so that it's better to revisit our development perspective with those different elements. But based on this now, so, so what is missing? We also heard today that um, politically we're organized. We've been told that at the political level there's the various structures at the AUC, uh, at, the Af at the African Union Commission, that are dealing with this, that Africa does have a position. But I seem to get a sense that actually there's, there's a lot missing. So maybe we can unpack this as well. Is Africa actually prepared? Are, are we engaged at the, at the global level? How, how do we stand? Politically, we are prepared for sure. There's no doubt about it. I remember in 92, in the preparation of the Rio summit, I tried to convince the African Minister of Environment that climate change is an issue. They said, no, this is not an issue at all for Africa. This is a European issue because they look at climate as only a problem of fossil fuel mitigations. And they said this is not an issue. I tried to organize a number of meetings. I did not succeed. And then they said desertification, land degradation is an issue. That is that lead to the Convention on, Clim on Land Degradation because the African accepted the climate. Uh, and then with the uh, having the um, uh, the Convention Desertification. Sure. And later on in Paris in uh, 2015, almost all the African head of the state were in Paris. Yes. And then the, at the level of head of the state, 
and, uh, and the government, they create what they call chaos, the Committee of Head of the State and, uh, on Climate Change, and then politically perfect. And so as, but the problem is that one has to, uh, to, to look at climate is driven by science. Mm -hmm. It's the basis. Because how we get the climate convention, it was based on the science, on the IPCC finding in 1998, uh, uh, 1988, when IPCC started. The first report came out in 91. And in 92, we had the convention. So it's driven by the, by the science. In each of the major steps of the climate or the, or the scientific finding, there is a political decision. The Kyoto Protocol was based on the IPCC second assessment report. Adaptation issues were based on the IPCC third assessment report. Mm -hmm. And then the two degree perspective was based on IPCC fourth assessment report. And then the Paris Agreement was based on the IPCC fifth assessment report. And then the problem is that there is a very limited of African scientists of, of the science in the climate discussion. There's no interaction between the policy makers, the high level policy maker, and the African scientists. I am elected member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change representing Africa. I'm not representing Mali, I'm representing Africa. I have no one to whom I'm accountable. Mm. So for I, you, it's the data. It's not, it's not any constituency. It's just to see, OK, what that, can that, we that, measure? That's the problem, because we never discuss with our constituencies, the policy makers. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the major issues that the science produce. And those are the major gap or scientific gap for better understanding the climate issue, the climate impact, in order to better inform the policies that will be uh, defining. Mm -hmm. The Americans do the same thing. The Europeans do the same thing. The Chinese do the same thing. All the different regions do the same thing. But the African is only related to negotiation. Mm -hmm. There is more interaction with a group of negotiators and the policy makers, no interaction between the scientists and the policy makers. We have no connection with the AMSEN, which is the African Ministerial Conference on Environment. Mm -hmm. And they have different meetings. They never, never ask us to come and then to present what are the latest findings of IPCC assessment report. So there's this disconnect between those negotiating and making policies who are working together, and you, the scientists, the researchers, on the other hand. Clearly, because we are assessing the uh, latest finding on the physical science, on the impact, on the vulnerability, mm -hmm. in order to better inform adaptation and mitigation strategy. How you can better inform mm -hmm. different strategies you define, you do not have a knowledge if you're not as assessing what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. This is the fundamental problem. So if, if we can dive then a little bit into some of these findings, if we can look at maybe the, the social and economic consequences, you know, and then we'll do the, some of the physical ones. I mean, Africa is a very large place, so of course it will be differentiated. But what is the science telling us about some of the consequences of climate change already, and some that maybe we should start thinking about that aren't necessarily being talked about? Globally, the, our findings across the world indicated the impact on the physical uh, system, on the biological system, on the socioeconomic system. The problem is that there is a limited research that is done in Africa for attribution. We may sense it that it has an impact on livelihood, it has an impact on uh, adversing the poverty, it's uh, all the gain that has been uh, hardly achieved in the development, mm -hmm. it has a huge impact on them, mm -hmm. but we have not done research on those different aspects. So not seeing just, the... Just to give you an example. Yes. In Yokohama, in 2014, we were approving the IPCC assessment report on adaptation, vulnerability, and impact. And if one asks a question, 
what is the major environmental issue in Africa, what will really come in mind of many people, they will say that drought desertification. In the report, there were not drought and desertification in Africa. And then all the delegates in Africa started saying that, no, this is not acceptable. They will not agree on that. The point is not saying that it's not acceptable, we don't agree. The mm. problem is that there is no scientific literature mm. that attributes. There's no evidence there's kind no of to evidence support the claim. As IPC is based on the evidence. That's and true. those are some of the elements our policymakers, our practitioners should understand that we need to have those evidence and it's based on those evidence and then we have, we are much more armed for negotiation. For say that this is what the science said. It is not a fiction. It is not an invention. It's what the literature tell us and then that is attributed to the, the climate and then we need collectively to find a solution. If we are not doing that, going only to negotiation saying that, oh, I have not caused a problem, that will not fly. But, but on this point, there is, a, there is a view, there is a genuine belief that you know, Africa's contribution to climate change is minimal. So, so why should we as Africa, why should we be concerned? Because climate is a global in nature. It doesn't matter if you emit in Dar es Salaam, in Dodoma, in Bamako, in Papua New Guinea, Atmosphere is unique. You cannot separate. You cannot make, make a wall. And then the consequences will spread. And that's the problem. It's a global in nature. So it, it, it depends. You cannot say, I have not done it. I will not do anything about it. But unless you accept suffering, and this is an issue, because there is no way you can adapt if you are not mitigating. Because there is a level of adaptation, it, is, it will not work at all. Because of the increase of mitigation, the two are going together. And then the best way is to find halfway between the two. And then our latest report on the special report on 1.5 indicated any bit of warming matters. So any increase, any increase, whether matters. it's one, two, three, one, point uh, and one, then, and then a half a degree matters mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. Any increase ma and any action matters. It's better for us. We can leapfrog, yeah. and those are the possibility of the African. And then we can leapfrog if we have a clear policy, a clear indication, backed by this evidence and science. As you exactly, said. we can do that. So just an example. You know, what kind of a tangible opportunity? presents itself now to, to policy makers and so on that you, that you can think of? Many opportunities exist. I indicated that we, the new stock of housing in Africa is much more important than the existing stock. We are in uh, tropical countries, uh, many dry countries, and we are building with cement, with concrete. And that is much more, you know, for the temperate climate. And then the, it, it's getting more hotter and hotter in African context. Building with cement, building the cement factories, that means it's much more a polluting sector, industrial sector. At the same time, when you do the building and you have air conditioning, that means increasing electricity and those different aspects. There is a wide range of alternative that will avoid having a cooling, we can have a natural cooling system. This is an opportunity we can look at. We can redesign the, our urban system and then to reduce the mobility. And then we are locked in the colonial uh, city systems where all the people have to go at the same time, the same place for all kinds of services. And then at the same time also going back for the homes and then to create a lot of problem. And there is a ways of solving that, that problem in the urbanization process that to reduce the mobility. We have the possibility also of looking at the energy system to build it completely differently from what you have seen because you have seen the revolution of renewables. And then you can make a combination of centralized and decentralized systems and then we can also look at completely revisit our agricultural system 
because we increase the production and the productivity by expanding, clearing more land, and then we can do the same thing by intensification. Just an example, the African farming system is using on the average between seven and 10 kilo per hectare. If we include South Africa, that's using 70 kilo per hectare. Kilos of? Of fertilizer sure. per hectare. Take Europe, it's, be it's between 500 and 600 kilo per hectare. Take China, 250 kilo per hectare. What can we expect getting from seven kilo per hectare or 10 kilo per hectare? In some cases, it's even one kilo per hectare if they have it, just one element. Which, which then opens up you know, desertification and deforestation exactly. because of clearing land. Exactly. So here you're talking more about and then, intensifying. And then the, the second is we have only at the maximum, maximum, three to seven percent of irrigated land. For the continent? For right? the continent. Okay. And then here again, South Africa is part of the overall. And then if you exclude South Africa, it will become negligible rent fed agriculture. And then while there is a huge potential for irrigation, it's related to energy. And then even the small scale farming system, and then you have, you can design an energy system adapted to that, and then you change completely the game by moving from rent fed to agricultural system, even if we go from 37% to 20, 30%, you change completely the game. Yeah. And then all those are at, our hands, all those can be done very easily. I would not say that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, because the renewables were not mature, they were very expensive, and actually it's accessible, it's mature, and you don't need storage. In order to do that, you don't need to store electricity in the farming system, and you, because why we look at, we said it's expensive, because you need the storage system. Because you need also a transport for alternative Quran. In that context, you don't need that. In a city, in a farm, you use it directly in the daytime. So like, uh, this is an off-grid kind of solution you're talking of? Then. Absolutely. Sure. And then you, have, you can have a combination of those different aspects. And even the issue of firewood. We do have a short term, a mid term, and a longer term perspective. A longer term perspective will be cooking with uh, electricity as this is done every elsewhere in the world. If you can have cheaper electricity, but in the meantime, we have to use the liquefied petroleum or the, LP, the, or the natural gas we do have in the continent. And that need to to, to think and then to do some research on end use equipment that is adapted to the African context, the African condition, and then the affordability also of the people. But all those need to be deliberately done. This is why I indicated that we need to completely revisit, to deconstruct the narrative of the problems, because the narrative we have, energy access, pay as you go, and then you can charge your telephone. And then the, telef the telephone, charging the telephone will uh, maybe, that is a good thing to pay your, uh, to do the banking, but that will not feed the people. So we're thinking of energy as an end rather than as a means to something else, if I'm understanding as, correctly. As a, a critical element for development. Sure. So you've listed a number of options though. Is there, and I don't want to, to come across as pessimistic, but can you think of something that is being done? You know, examples that, of where this is being taken forward, where people are looking at alternatives. Just in case there are people watching who say, okay, we hear your options, we hear the plight. Do you, can you think of an example where people can go to learn to find out more about how that science, how the policymakers are coming together to say, we're gonna try something different? In all those cases across the continent, here and there, we do have examples so on projects. Are. Because the problem is, our project is not informing the policy. So they're almost experiments, almost. Exactly, because this is driven by, you know, one donor came and then he experiments something here, and then tomorrow another donor will come. You go to any African country, you will find a project, German project. 
the, uh, the uh, USAID project, the UNDP project, and they even said the World Bank project, how a bank whose lending can have a project in a country, it's a country project. And then those are the problem, we do not have the policy. Because projects should inform policy. And then we do have wealth of experience. And then what we indicated also in a way forward is to have an assessment of the lesson learned on all those different front in the last 20 to 30 years in order to better inform the policy. We do development by policy, we not do development by project. Project mean, I have an idea. Piloting almost. Yes, I don't know if it work yeah. or if it not work. And then in order to better inform my policy, I will initiate a project. It should inform the, 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 uh, the policy. If it's not informing the policy, it doesn't make any sense. So to take a, a, a different approach, just to, let's take a global view. Where does Africa sit currently then within the global architecture around climate change? Because it seems on the one hand we're being impacted the most and yet we contribute the least. Politically we're ready but scientifically we don't have the evidence. So, so where, where, where does Africa sit in the, in the architecture? I mean, Do we have a voice? Do we? Sure, we have a voice because uh, our voice is heard at the uh, climate negotiations. It is not an issue at international level. But the problem is that we do not have, we are not doing our homework. For instance, we have a limited funding for climate, but the existing one, the Africans do not have access. It is because they cannot have access because they are not doing their homework in order to have access to those funding. You go to GCF, it's only 4% of the funding that African countries have access. And then there is a disconnect between those who are going to negotiation, those who are connected to the, uh, those uh, funding mechanisms, and then those who are doing activities at the country level. And there is no feedback, no discussion, no uh, uh, strategic discussion at home. The very few countries organize that kind of discussion. So far, I know in the context of South Africa, negotiators, the scientists, the policy makers, and then they get together and they have some conversations some discussion on the perspective on the strategy they need to follow. And this needs to be done. Do we have, we do have at least, at least seven mechanisms of funding any African country have access through from the GF to the least developed country funding to the adaptation fund to the GCF and the other. This is only multilateral. And these are specific to climate change? Specific to climate change. I don't know which country are strategically positioned in self. And then to have access to those funding and to exhaust those funding. And then to look at the bigger picture. And those are some of the fundamental elements we need to, I have not kept across any clear vision on together, African country coming together to say that this is the way we need to look at. This is how we have to look at those targeting those funding that exists. They are very small. Yeah, but it, it still, but every still, still it exists yeah. that we are not using. And then who is using them? It's the UN institution. And then who are taking it because they need resources and then they will take 15% of the for their management, for their own institution, and a reminding there will be some, you know, meeting conferences uh, here and there in the African country, and uh, this is the, the reality. And then we need to change that. So despite this rather bleak outlook, from your view, how is Africa faring in terms of meeting its commitments? Because it has made commitments, and it seems there are obvious challenges. But are we as a continent meeting our commitments? And while thinking about Africa, are, is the rest of the world relative also meeting its commitments? No, prior to Paris, uh, all the countries have been asked to determine their national contribution and then what they want to do. And then all the countries disregarding if they are developed or developing country, African and European country, all indicated. And clearly it indicates that is far below what needs to be done. 
The reality is that many of the African country is consultants who fly in the country and then define what the country has to do on the climate front. There were no discussion at national level. There were no interaction with different stakeholders to say that this is our agenda, this is our development agenda, this is how it articulated the climate, this is what we can do without any support from outside, and this is what we can do if we get support from outside. And then those are the things, and that need to be revisited by the whole stakeholder, as I indicated, with the, bringing the three communities together the policy, the practice, and then the knowledge community, the scientific community, so that it really were articulated what need to be done, how it need to be done. I hope the forum will help actioning those kind of perspective and then to push action in those kind of perspective. Setting the agenda is very important. If you are not setting the agenda, someone else will set the agenda. And then if you set your agenda, it will not be on your perspective. It will be for your perspective. As a matter of fact, the negotiator of Africa, sometimes they are paid by uh, our counterpart to take the African negotiator to go to London and then have a training how to negotiate with Europeans. And this is the irony of the things we are, uh, you know, they can come to Ngozi uh, institute here in Dar es Salaam, and then to have a discussion among themselves with the policy makers and what will be the negotiation line, rather than going to Oxford in London and then funded by European Union, and then to go to negotiate with the European Union. But, but, but here there's also a question of resources. I mean, Africa is trying to industrialize, and it's putting its efforts in that you know, baskets so of the education, the infrastructure, these are the, you know, the developmental priorities. There is a real sense that actually this agenda of climate change is just being used to keep these aspirations down. And, you know, how do you react to that sentiment, to that, that narrative that exists? It exists, but uh, the problem is that this is the other narrative, because I just what I said that we need to articulate our own narrative and then to deconstruct what has been done and then to put forward our, uh, our narrative, starting development first. I set up the African Climate Policy Center in 2010, and one of the critical elements is that development first. Let us start climate conversation with development first. And then, when, then the second stage will be how we make development more sustainable, because sustainability is an aspiration. It's not ended by itself. And then the third question will be how you make it climate compatible. And then those are the approach we need to take. And this is what we indicated. We started with the African Climate Policy Center. And then we set up an annual conference. This is climate and development in Africa. It's a year conference. It's still going on. And then those are the things we need to push. Those are the things we need to articulate. And then to, in order to uh, be able to, if you set the, your agenda, and then you will take a lead in negotiating your agenda. If you are not setting your agenda, you cannot negotiate the other agenda. And as we start to come towards the end of the interview, um, from an African perspective or looking broadly on the continent, what is something that we can take away as a success? I mean, clearly we're, we're clearly challenged by climate change. But how have you seen a kind of climate change success story, either through mitigation or adaptation, something that it's, it's truly an African solution to, okay, a global, but at least an African problem in that sense. I think that there is a, a sense, a common sense at different arena from the policy makers to uh, practitioners to the private sector and then to academia, there is a critical issue. And then this is very important. And then we do have, here and there, a number of emerging actions uh, in the field, on whether on mitigation, on adaptation. And then the real uh, problem is that to move the climate issues as an environmental issue to make it at the center of development. Because one can understand in the case of industrialized country, it could be an environmental aspect because they realize their development perspective 
and then they need, they look at some of the weaknesses on development and then they create environment. In the African context, we are in an early stage. We do have to move a bit on and to put at the center of development and then bringing together the different stakeholders give to us much more perspective. And then also, not only considering the climate, uh, the, the COP, the conferences, the annual conference, they are good, they are important, but we do need to have our own agenda. And then to pursue our agenda at the national level, and then at the regional level, SEDAC, SADEC, ECOWAS, Comesa and different, and then at the continental level, and then moving toward those uh, different perspectives, and then I am pretty sure that we'll be able to find adequate solution in the short term. And then also, there is many aspects we can gain on the economy of scales, because most of the action are uh, small scale, are limited in scope, and then by bringing those different aspects and then uh, to put together also the, you know, uh, the limited resources we have. That mean human resources, institution, organizations, and even in sometimes some financial resources. So one of the senses I'm getting is that a lot of this is a very top heavy approach. You know, we are seeing governments organized, people official and so on. But there's, there's another element to this, you know, the people, the, the grassroots, the civil societies and so on. You know, what's, what's your view of, of their kind of engagement when it comes to the African continent? Here again, I see a critical role that needs to be played by uh, some of the African think tanks, such as Ngozi Institute, and particularly targeting uh, different groups and particularly the youth. And then to take, for instance, the IPCC report, and then the IPCC special report, and then to have a derivative product for the youth, because climate is about the future. It's about present, but it's more about the future. And then the young generation, the kids, at the, from the kindergarten to universities, they need to be aware mm -hmm. because we do not have to create awareness where there is an event such as the flooding, the, the cyclone that happened in Mozambique and the different area in a continuous basis. And then to have a derivative product and then for them to uh, educate them. And then as uh, it has been uh, discussed during the forum, to change behavior, and then that is a matter of generation to be to have a climate consciousness. We have seen a growing, a growing movement of the youth, of the students in Europe on the climate uh, issues, making a pressure on government to take action. This is the Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg's leadership. leadership. Yeah. And then I received to them in Geneva as a vice chair of IPCC a few days ago. And there were a number of you know, kids coming from different places in the world, Latin America, Europe, and countries I have not seen in Africa. And I told them that why they are not you know, widening the scope. And then mm. Where are the Africans? The, the, the <laughs> African, and then this is an issue. And I think that Ungozi Institute can also create, a, initiate by informing, by educating, by uh, uh, raising awareness at the, at the level of the student in the different schools, universities, in order to have that consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then that can be based on derivative product of the IPCC report. 1.5, what that means for Africa, what the implication in the short term, in the longer term, in a very simplified uh, language, so that is accessible for them. And then that will, you know, create a new generation of thinking for a long-term perspective. I imagine 30 years ago, in any conference room, having ashro for smoking was normal, and today is not at all normal. It's abnormal, because how we have been able to do it? 
by educating, by informing, and by creating some you know, uh, regulation on those different issues, climate is exactly the same thing. So it's and a matter of people engaging young people and the citizens, but also for those citizens to come forward and say, look, we're concerned as well. And then the, the problem is that by educating the young people, by educating the kids, and then they will make an influence on their parents. And then they will say that this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. You know, if your, you know, if your kid, you go to home, if your kid said that cigarettes is not good for health, and then you are a father, and then you will think about it. You feel it. a bit of that pressure to, to exactly. change. Exactly. And then this is something we need to work on. And then it's their future. And this is the much more important. It's their present. It's our present. But it's their future. And then they have to be aware. Because they will be the future leaders. They will be the future decision makers. And then they, any, we, we indicated also in the IPCC report, any action matters. Any year matters. And then the decision we make now, we have a huge implication in the years to come. And then it's very important that they have a clear understanding that before making any kind of decision, they have to think about what will be the consequences, the implications. It's so our tradition on the show as the kind of last and final question. What, what key message do you want our audience to take away from, from clearly your passion, from today's conversation, from the work that you do? What is it that you know, our, our practitioners, our leaders, our, you know, our people on the continent, really you feel need to either know or need to do or need to be inspired by or weary of when it comes to climate change? To navigate permanently between the imperative of the short term and the long term. Because the short term that you feed people to get today, you give to them some specific element. At the same time, we have to anticipate the problem. This is very difficult to do. And then I think that we are in a better position to make that navigation between the imperative of the short term and long term. Development is a short term issue, and then climate change is a long term issue. And then if we have to think about navigating those two. And then only if you have a system leadership. I'm not certain any kind of leader, but system leadership. A leadership that can bring a larger leadership in different sectors, and then to bring together, and then we will be able to do it. That system leadership will have clearly a vision. And that vision needs to be translated in concrete action, and then you need adequate institution in order to translate that vision in a concrete action. Now, for that, you will mobilize a number of resources, but rooted in imperative of navigating short term and long term. And you remain optimistic that this is possible and we have that window. If I was not optimistic, I would not come to the forum. Well, on that note, thank you very much for coming on the program and welcome back anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much.